सद्यो जात प्रपद्याम सद्यो जाथा वै नमो नम भवे भवे नाति भवे भवस्व भवोद भवाय नम वामदेवाय नमो ज्येष्ठा नम श्रेष्ठा नमो रुद्रा नम कालाय नम कल विकनाय नमो बल विकनाय नमो बलाय नमो बल प्रमथनाय नम सर्वूतमनाय नमो मनोन्मनाय नम अघोरेभ्यो घोरेभ्यो घोर घोरतरेभ्य सर्वेभ्यो नमस्ते अस्तु रुद्रूपेभ्य तत्षा विमे महादेवाय धीम तो रुद्र प्रचोदया ईशान सर्वद्यानाशरसूता ब्रह्मधिपतिर्ब्रह्मनोधिपतिर्ब्रह्म शिव मे अस्तु सदा शिव Thanks for coming out on this rainy evening. At least it's not raining like yesterday. It could be tricky to come. <laughs> so I've got my clock here to try to keep me on time, and my notes to try to keep me focused on what I'm intending to talk about, which may or may not happen despite my notes. <laughs> Well, I was um, editing, or we were making new packages for the Ayurvedic herbal teas that we sell, and I was editing the packages, and we saw that one of the teas it has a benefit, it gives you a clam mind. Mm. I think we meant to write calm. Really? We've been selling this tea for like oh. two years. It gives you a clam mind. <laughs> I was trying to imagine what that is. I'm not sure a clam even has a mind. Yeah, right. There's a clam. Mind. He's open or closed, right? Yeah, I'm not sure there's much mind that has. Like, ooh, that feels nice. <laughs> not so nice. <laughs> like a stressful existence, right? <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Not, not so nice. <laughs> Only concerned with the essentials. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the clam is probably pretty stressed out. I think that's probably how he makes the pearl. He's just like... <laughs> that's how nature makes a gemstone, right? After thousands of years of rocks pushing down with pressure. The clam does it. I don't know how long clam lives. He <laughs> makes a pearl. Wow. Yeah. That's how we live. That's how most people on this earth are living. That feels nice. That's not so nice. It's an instinctive response, instinctive reaction. And so the traditional practice of yoga can help us to overcome those instinctive tendencies within the mind. Everything is, is good, only we don't always choose to see it that way. Yoga helps us to, to see what is, it helps us to see the divine in all things. It helps us to be calm and still in our situation, but people now practice yoga in a very different way. And they'll tell you the benefits of yoga is it will give you the, the clam mind. <laughs> and it does. When you go to the yoga class to try to get a better looking body, to try to feel better because your body looks prettier or more toned or something, you're building up that ego and you're giving strength to the clam mind. <laughs> Really, you have to have a calm mind to practice yoga. You have to have some 
detachment from what's going on. You have to have some wisdom. You have to have selflessness. It's not safe to teach yoga to just anybody, really. A traditional teacher in India, the student would come and say, Oh, well, can you teach me yoga? And the guru would, would say, Okay, let's see. And he'd assign some tasks to the student to help you know, fulfill the, the mission of teaching or whatever the mission of that teacher is. He'll get the student helping with some tasks there. And at the same time, he'll start giving him some instruction about nature, about the nature of the body, about the nature of yoga, about what the practice does so the student has some expectation this may happen. And as this starts to happen, this is how I can respond and benefit from what's happening. Otherwise, the practices of yoga, either they won't have their effect or they'll have that effect and that won't benefit the student because they won't be prepared to benefit from what, what happens. If you have that, that tendency like the clam, as soon as yoga starts having its effects, it will feel a little uncomfortable perhaps and the person will retract. They'll start making excuses. This must be a bad practice, a bad teacher because the instinct is to avoid what's a little bit uncomfortable, and it can be more than a little bit uncomfortable to be practicing yoga. And so, you know, I, nowadays teachers don't have a sense of responsibility for what they're doing to their students. Swamis come from India, and they teach a little bit of teachings, and they cause the, the Christian people here in the West to get upset and turn against their Christian religion. They're not bringing them into the Hindu religion. They're, they're cutting them off from having a relationship with the divine by giving them some partial teaching, not bringing them fully into the spiritual practices. In the same way, if someone's teaching some of the, the practices like meditation, yoga practices, and people start having the effects, things come up from the subconscious mind. If that student has not been prepared to face and resolve those things as they come up, the potential for them acting out on these negative thoughts and feelings is very great, and they can cause themselves more pain and suffering. And so yoga teachers don't think in those terms that they're responsible for what their students are doing with faith. They don't try to prepare them. Not many students want the preparation. They want to dive right into the practice. So there may be less students in a serious yoga class where the teacher is taking time to explain these things before they're teaching the practices. But then if that teacher is motivated by making money, then they may teach what the people want instead. In the yoga classes, people mainly are not getting the benefits, but if they do, they're not so well prepared. Even the swamis and gurus coming from India, they may give a spiritual initiation without giving much preparation. I met a woman who was, she, <laughs> I think her whole problem was she, she went to meet this guru. And the guru was doing an initiation for a group of students he'd been preparing for. It's an interesting story. It shows us why the preparation is very important. <laughs> he was doing an initiation that day they were doing a public program, everyone could come, and then to the side, in a side room, he was doing the initiation for the group of students who had been preparing themselves over the past seven months or whatever. This woman got very discombobulated from this spiritual energy, which will often happen to people in the presence of a spiritual teacher or any place where they're doing puja or whatever. The energy starts working on a person and their mind just gets discombobulated a little bit and they start walking around doing strange things. It doesn't make much sense. This woman got discombobulated while the guru went in the other room to give the initiation. She walked into that room. <laughs> and the people were all lined up, to re standing lined up to receive the initiation. And so I guess she just fell into line because people are like sheep and they'll do what the other people are doing. And the guru got to her and he's like, huh, I didn't train her, but she's here. So I guess God wants her to get the initiation. <laughs> he gave her the initiation. And so all of a sudden, 
she started hearing all these voices talking to her. She got really confused and scared and upset. She quit her job. The doctors told her she was schizophrenic. She got put on medicine. She was totally unhappy, not able to do anything anymore. For like two years she was like this and I met her. <laughs> I talked to her for about two hours. I explained what was happening, prayed for her a little bit so she'd get grounded. And she was fine. She went back to work. No problem. <laughs> Yeah. It can be important to get the, the teachings, or we may not get too much effects either, you know, and that's, that's, that's not as big of a concern though, really, you know, you can go and do aerobics, no problem. But also when people try to give a spiritual teaching as a part of their yoga class, they're often influenced more by this New Age philosophy, rather than the philosophy of yoga. Someone spoke to me earlier today, I'm trying to see what his wording was. He went to a workshop his last weekend about getting your heart's desire. Sounds real good, right? <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of yoga, though. We don't want to increase desire. When we do things to get what we desire, we may increase the desire. It's fine if you have desire. Go work in the world for what you want, no problem. It's one way to know what your karmas are, your attachments, by what you desire. If it's a good thing, by seeking fulfillment to those desires. You desire a promotion in your work. Fine. Work really hard. Try to get that. Maybe when you get it, then you realize you're still unhappy, then you have less desire for that. I'm still not happy, still not at peace. Maybe I want something greater, but you know, you can't see that if you're too busy, if you're caught in these other desires. If it's a good thing, work for it, no problem. But you shouldn't necessarily do your yoga practice to get what you want. You know, this is, this is the story in the Bible of the Tower of Babel. There's stories in the Vedas like this too where the person tries to take their physical body into heaven. You can't get mystical powers, you can't get mystical awareness and then keep all of your stupidity and your ego at the same time. You have to drop off the stupidity to get wisdom. You have to drop off the ego to get realization and spiritual powers. This is how nature protects people. And we think now, and it's a very new age concept, we can bend nature to our will. What you believe you can have, you can have it. It's an enticing concept. There's some truth to that, you know, I, the, the flip side of that, and definitely has some truth. If you're afraid of something, you're trying to push it away, you'll probably draw it to yourself. That's certainly true. Certainly we limit ourselves by our beliefs. But trying to get ourselves to believe that we can fulfill the desires of the ego isn't necessarily going to be a freeing experience. It's not going to help us to get elevated spiritually. We want to bend nature to our will. But yoga is a process of aligning yourself with nature. We get upset where we get happy based upon our attachments, our thoughts, our feelings, and we say, this is good, this is bad. But it's not good. I mean, really, everything's good. God created everything intentionally. So everything's good. There may be pain, there may be pleasure, sure. Darkness, light, yeah. Hot, cold, all these differences, but neither one is good. Hot is good, cold is good, pain is good, pleasure is good. No problem, unless we choose to make it a problem. This good and evil is a concept created by the human mind. Even animals don't have good and evil. Plants don't have good and evil. They grow toward the light. Even the clam probably doesn't have good or evil. He just, I like that, I don't like that. Either one is bad, probably. He doesn't have enough of a brain to think it out that way, but we have a complex 
mind. So we make life much more complex than it is, much more complex than it needs to be. Really, yoga is aligning ourselves with nature and getting beyond these, these human concepts and these attachments and desires. We cause ourselves so much suffering just not being able to flow with what's happening, not being satisfied with what is going on. Yet at every moment, what's going on is exactly what we need to be taking our next steps on the spiritual path, to be getting more wisdom, more happiness, more peace, more freedom. We're given that opportunity in every moment to get more knowledge. It's coming. The universe is giving it in every moment, and it's just a question of whether we can recognize that or not. In order to practice yoga, we have to have this understanding. That's why to, to practice yoga we need a teacher to teach us about this, because it's not self-explanatory. It's not logical, really. It goes beyond logic. The more we think, the more unhappy we get. There's been studies done that shows a direct correlation between a very high level of intelligence and mental illnesses and depression and things not necessarily an advantage. I, I feel like it's a disadvantage on the spiritual path for someone who's very intellectual and very intelligent. Because we can't really understand God by thinking about God any more than a computer can understand the person who programmed it. A computer can do amazing things and the mind can do amazing things. But it can't really understand nature because that's not a logical thing. So we need the teacher to teach us about the process, and generally people need the teacher to initiate the process of spiritual awakening as well, because the ego is grasping on to all these attachments just by its nature. So when practice is initiated from the ego, when you read the book and say, I want to do that for some reason, Ego still is going to be grasping by nature to stuff. Its nature is not to let go. But the teacher's presence in someone's life can help that detachment to begin. It can help the process of awakening to begin. So when students come to a teacher, they're not prepared. They'll come, they'll receive the blessings from the teacher, they're very happy about that. And they may experience some healing or some benefits in their life. And they, they expect that. They come when they have problems. They say, oh, help me with this problem. I'm feeling sick, make that go away. My child didn't get married yet. I get that a lot from the Indian. My child is not married. I don't have a grandson yet. My grandson's not getting into law school. Swamiji, can you please help? <laughs> can you do the puja and make him go to law school? Swamiji, it's terrible. I don't think he even wants to go to law school. <laughs> can you do the puja to make him want to go to law school? <laughs> I tell them, that's not puja, that's black magic. <clears throat> and that's not yoga, that's trying to bend the universe to your will for it. That's not aligning yourself with what's happening around you in the universe. Everything's perfect, whatever's happening. It may not be what we were expecting, it's never what I was expecting. But at the same time, I practice not being so upset about that. And that's what yoga helps us to do. For us to remain steady through the ups and downs of life. Not for us to still the world around us. Who are we to improve upon what God created? So getting the blessings from a teacher may simply amplify the desires of these sorts of students who come with a lot of desires. They experience some amount of healing, and they just want more. So 
like any material desire. If you get a little more money, then you're still dissatisfied. So you want a little more money then, you want a little more money. You always could have more money. You'd probably never be satisfied. This kind of student, even when they do the practice, nothing is gained for them. Maybe a couple of moments of peace here and there. Because they don't have peace coming to the practice, they won't get the benefits of the practice. They'll just find a little bit of peace here and there. But not even that much, because they're not really trying to get rid of their ego. They'll, they'll be refusing to do some service for the teacher. They won't have interest in donating or helping with the services the teacher is trying to provide to people for society. <clears throat> and ultimately, if the teacher tries to really teach them about things, they don't want to hear it. And then when that teacher withholds the blessings also, they get angry. They'll become abusive. <clears throat> Because they have too much ego. They don't even really want to do the practice. You know, it's one reason that teachers in India sit up and all the students sit on the ground. <laughs> Years ago I had a, a satsang going in a different town than this one. And people were coming, I had 20, 30 people coming every week. They were very happy for the teachings I was giving and all that kind of thing. But something, I, I could see something, they weren't really getting the teachings. And they, they may have been doing some outer practices, but they weren't really doing the practices. So the next week I sat up on a chair and had them sit on the floor. <laughs> they got upset. <laughs> Who are you to sit up on the chair? We don't like this. And next week, no one came. <laughs> I was like, great, I've got more time for doing my pujas. This is fun. <laughs> I don't have to talk to these people. They had stupid questions, honestly. So I was not sure I was really able to benefit them, and so I was happy to see them go. But people get into a thing like that. That's one reason things like that are in place. Is to help save everyone's time so that student doesn't come and cause problems for the other student. They're so full of doubts they'll start talking negative things and cause the other students who were doing fine to start doubting. It's better to have them gone. When I used to teach in yoga teacher training programs, I agreed to do that again. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> We'd get one or two students every time and they just had huge problem hearing everything I was saying and they'd get like really, really upset. <laughs> there was one lady who I, she thought I was the devil. <laughs> Not like a demon or something, but like the devil. <laughs> I don't even believe in the devil. You know, but not just when I would be giving the teaching and the rest of her segments, when she'd be doing an anatomy section with someone else and she'd like disrupt the class to go on and on about how I was the devil and shouldn't be teaching. <laughs> they had to kick her out. And before they kicked her out, the whole class was doing poorly. No one was able to benefit from the teachings we were giving. But when they got rid of her then, all of a sudden everyone started to know their anatomy and they were doing fine, not causing problems. You have one troublemaker in a group, sometimes it can cause problems for the whole group. So it's good not to have to deal with these people. And if they start doing the practice to build up their ego, to fulfill their desires in the world, as they come to disappointments, it's going to be a dramatic downfall for them. It's not always pretty. It's not always beneficial. And I'm sure that people, ultimately, certain people, they need a lot of pain to learn. I shouldn't do that. It's like they're hitting their thumb with a hammer. Bam, bam, bam. Ow. 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 <laughs> and eventually it'll hurt enough to say, oh, I should stop that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what they mean when they talk about alcoholics and they say, he's got to come to the rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Because something in their mind isn't getting it. They may know intellectually this alcohol is no good for me. 
but they're not really believing it. It's not something on a deeper level that they understand and that they believe. Because they haven't seen enough. They don't have enough wisdom from their experience to, to get that, to understand that that's not benefiting them. And so some people, they're, they're stuck with the world as their guru because they've got too much ego and not enough wisdom, not enough ability to see. And so by making mistakes in the world again and again, they're going to take a long and painful path to the same place everyone else is going. Uh, so the reason for giving these, these teachings is to help prepare people really to be doing a more traditional practice of yoga. We've got to understand the concept of dharma, that we have a duty. My duty may not be the same as Sid's duty. Sid works as a, uh, you work with computers. What do you do? Data, data analyst. He's a data analyst. So part of his duty, he's got to analyze the data. It's not a part of my duty, necessarily. Based upon where we're born in the world, we may have a different sense of duty, a different dharma that we have to fulfill. But ultimately, to seek realization according to our ability is a part of our, our duty in a higher sense. To pay off debts, we have to family, to friends. We have a debt to our mom and dad just for being born. We have an opportunity to resolve our karmas and to realize God now in this life because our mother and father brought us into this world. We have a duty to them. We have a debt to them, so to speak, on account of that. So we owe them something. We've got to have relationships with people in the world. We may feel that we owe things to society. There's five, they call it the Pancha Maha Yakjam, the five great sacrifices that we're supposed to make on a regular basis. We have a debt to the to five different groups, they say. And for that purpose, we, we make these offerings traditionally in different ways. To the sages we we have a debt because they've given the wisdom of the, the Vedas and the practices that can cause liberation. So traditionally the way to pay off that debt is by chanting some Vedas regularly. Although that could be, you know, it could be different because there are texts about yoga as well, doing a yoga practice regularly. Something like that. We have a debt to the living teachers who are helping us to understand how to do these practices. And so helping to spread their teachings or you know, helping with the work they're doing in some way is a way to pay off that debt. A debt to the ancestors. So their rituals to pray for them. We can just pray for them in whatever way we can. Making offerings for them to help resolve their karmas, to help dissolve our attachments to them. Is a debt to society, to serving society in some way, doing some service, and a debt to nature around us for supporting us. The food that we eat comes from nature. We have a debt there so we can feed animals and water plants and that kind of thing to fulfill that debt. Hmm. We're going to talk tonight about the eight limbs of yoga practice according to Patanjali and we're going to talk about four different types of yoga practice. I'm talking from the, the teachings of, of my teacher who was in Patanjali's lineage. This is the, we don't get the full teaching of Patanjali because he wrote the very short text. People read that little text and they take it out of the context not knowing the other things about his tradition, um, the Shaiva Siddhanta tradition, Patanjali was a part of. He was a teacher in the Nandinata Sampradaya, that's the name of the lineage, but you know, it, 
Shaiva Siddhanta tradition. We hear a lot about Vedanta. Shankaracharya is one teacher who talked about Vedanta. We don't hear as much about Siddhanta. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the, the philosophy of that, just a little. Based upon our, our karma, we'll incarnate in a different place. We did a lot of bad things in the previous life. We may be born into poverty in this lifetime with a lot of challenges, and that will affect our dharma in this lifetime. Karma means action. I'm going to get back to karma, but what we do, what, what energy we put out there, basically, is that, that comes back to us. When we act out of attachment, the fruit of that action will come back to us, for better or for worse. That's the thought of karma. Uh, it's a useful concept when we're bound by certain limitations. Nature has a tendency to work in that way. That what you put out will come back. We don't see that we're connected to things around us. So we don't necessarily have compassion for other people. We don't get angry at our hand if it's hurting and cut it off or something. But we get angry at a person who is causing us pain because we view it as separate from us. We try to get them away, cut them out of our lives. But as awareness expands, we can see that's a part of ourself also. And it makes no more sense to attack a person who's causing you troubles than it makes to cut off your hand because it has pain. <clears throat> so the Shaiva Siddhanta philosophy teaches us that everything is good, everything is God. Yoga teaches us that the, the soul is God. They say, you know, in Shaivism, they say the name for God is Shiva. And so they say the jiva, the embodied soul, the jiva, is Shiva. Ultimately, that's the ultimate truth we come to. But the reason we don't see that, they, they have a, an analogy they give. They talk about pati, which means Lord, Pati, Pashu, which means a creature, an animal, and Pasha. Pasha means a chain or something which is binding. And so in this analogy, the image is that there's a... Pati also could be a lord or master. So the imagery there is it's a cow herd, a cow. Cow herd, I mean the, the like the the guy who's controlling the cow. Not a herd of cows. <laughs> and then there's a cow. Is a pashu. And then the pasha is a, if you have the cow on a rope, you let the cow out into the pasture. So the cow herd can bring the cow back eventually at the end of the day, back to the cow shed to feed the cow. But the cow's out in the pasture grazing you can keep the cow from running away. You can pull him back eventually with that. You know, this, this pasha is binding the cow to some extent. But, but it's the same thing that will pull the cow back in. And so being out in the pasture grazing is like the soul being in the world, being engrossed in the world. And ultimately through these same things that bind us, and cause us trouble and suffering in life, the soul is motivated back and back toward the Lord. Ultimately, the Lord is in all three. The Lord is in the Lord, and the Lord is in the creation. The Lord is beyond the creation, and He's within the creation, pervading everything that He created. You see, that's one thing the Lord doesn't have. The Lord has limitless power, but doesn't have the power to separate Himself and His nature from the creation. So they talk of three 
Pashas to further elaborate upon this. And when you see someone wearing the three lines of Vibhuti, the white ash, it symbolizes the, the three Pashas and the burning away of you. The ash comes from burning of a fire, and so burning away these three fetters that bind us to the world. And so what are these three in the Shaiva Siddhanta philosophy, the three Pashas, the three binding factors that keep the soul not seeing nature beyond? The first and the, the most essential, the most important is Anava. Anava means limitation in Sanskrit. It's a sense of being limited or finite. In reality, we are infinite, but we have the sense that we are limited, that we are finite. So this is the, the first thing that binds us, it's the most fundamental thing there. From that comes karma, from a sense of being bound, we, we act and we create karma. If you think of an animal, acting instinctively, like the clam, you've got an animal out in an open space and he sees you, he'll probably just run away. If you've got an animal in the corner and you close in on him in the corner, he'll probably attack you. You think of birds, even, like a sparrow, I heard. If, uh, it's interesting how I heard this. I, I knew one guy who was training some crazy martial arts and as he was finishing learning that style of martial arts, his test was they blindfolded him and put him in a room with a sparrow. <laughs> and apparently, you know, if, if the room has an open window, the sparrow will fly out the window. He'll say, no thanks, I don't want to be around the people I'm leaving. However, if the sparrow it doesn't see an opening, so they close all the doors and close it off, close the window, board it up or put a blind or something so the sparrow sees no way out. His nature, his instinct, he'll go for your eye. <laughs> and so blindfolded, they made this guy fight the sparrow. <laughs> it just sounds ridiculous to me. But it illustrates my point that, you know, when the animal feels that he's bound, when he feels stuck in the corner, he's going to start acting out. He'll lash out and try to get you. And most animals are pretty nice until they're feeling cornered. Even wild animals will tend to run the other way. I've seen bears in the forest a few times and they're always running the other way. It may have been a different story if he was feeling threatened. And so from this sense of feeling limited, we feel threatened or whatever. And then we act. And this creates karma. If we lash out because we're feeling threatened, someone then will lash out at us an equal measure, roughly. That's the law of karma. You know, and ultimately, we were not threatened to begin with. Mm. So the third of these three pashas is maya. Maya. Which people think of maya as a veil of delusion. In the Vedanta philosophy, they describe maya as a veil of delusion. And they say maya is bad. They say the world is bad, and they're big into renunciation and asceticism. But in the, the Shaiva Siddhanta philosophy, they say maya is the world. From karma comes maya, and maya is the phenomenal world around us which is caused and generated by the actions of people. Mm. And it's not bad. It may be a limiting factor. Our soul is somewhat limited by this body in the world. The soul is infinite, the body is finite. We got this sense that we were not infinite, we started acting out of that in some sense, and now we're stuck in this body. It's like the physical manifestation of this. We're talking about the causal plane, the astral plane, the physical plane. But in the Siddhanta philosophy, we don't say the world is evil or bad. 
We say the world is good and it's a necessary part of our process. In the world only, living in the world, in this human body only, can we do spiritual practice and release the karma. And relationships in the world are good. We probably have karmas with those particular souls, maybe knew them before. If you're meeting someone, probably you knew them before and there's something that needs to be completed there. There may be a debt that needs to be paid, understanding that needs to be come to between the people or something. I see a lot of people arguing with their families and their father dies and they're angry. Those people then take the anger to their grave. Say, I don't want to think about it, I don't want to forgive him, I don't want to ever see him again, and they're surely going to be born back into that same family because the anger is an attachment. And we see some people and we feel, I don't like that guy. <laughs> Probably he did something to you last time and you're still angry. Because <laughs> you're thinking with that clam mind, I don't like that. I'm angry and I don't like that guy. <clears throat> so the world is necessary for advancement. Everything is necessary for advancement. Everything is an opportunity to someone doing a spiritual practice. And we're saying, what we see people say in movies and everywhere, we probably hear people say at our job, this happened, that was terrible. We have a thought, certain things are bad, certain things are good. It's all an opportunity. I'm counseling a young woman right now who, like, her best friend in the world was her sister. And her sister just died tragically at the age of, like, 20 or something. And she's struggling with that, that feeling of loss. And a lot of people around her are saying, you know, that's terrible, I'm so sorry. And she's understandably experiencing a lot of grief and even some anger. Why did this happen, she's thinking. And everyone's saying, I'm so sorry, this is so bad. And so when I talk to her, I'm trying to help her to see, this is a blessing, this is a great opportunity. She had been doing a spiritual practice when this started happening, and now these deep levels of emotion are coming up. She's seeing levels of her attachments to things that she was not really as much aware of before. She's got a good opportunity to work through that and release some of that if she chooses to view the situation as such. Everything is a good opportunity. Everything's a lesson, a teaching, a test. Or everything's a curse. When a person's angry, everything around them will look terrible. The world looks like a violent, nasty place. You can tell how people are within themselves by how they describe the world around them. When you're feeling sad, you'll notice certain things and you'll perceive things in a different way based upon that sadness you're feeling. If you're feeling angry, you'll see things in a certain way. And if you're feeling happy and peaceful, you'll see things in a certain way. And if you want to feel more peaceful and more happy, you can start to try to see things in a positive way and say, okay, this is a great opportunity. This is a gift from God, this experience. <clears throat> Challenging experiences are some of the best on the spiritual path, really, because who has a motivation to look for something beyond when they're enjoying life too much? There's one reason I think at one of the Veda schools, the priest told me they had all the priests in training sleep on the floor. He said they had a wool blanket that would scratch you every time you had moved. He said that they felt like that blanket was reminding them every time it scratched them, you're practicing celibacy. <laughs> you're not enjoying life. You're, you're doing this. You're doing... He said their pillow was this, and it got very cold. And they had just the top robe and the bottom robe. They were up in the hill station in the mountains, so it got in Shringiri, so it got pretty cold. It's likely not enough to really warm them enough. And he said the food was terrible. I think the food was intentionally terrible. <laughs> They're probably cooking nice food for God and giving these guys bad food. <laughs> intentionally, as a part of the practice. Because when we're too comfortable, 
people have this thought, if it's not broken, then why will I fix this? If you're too comfortable in life, how are you going to seek something more? A lot of people, they get pushed into their spiritual practice by great struggles in life. Things that other people would look at as tragedy, they start to see, well, that was the greatest blessing in my life because before that I was miserable and caught in this cycle of open, closed, clam mind. And after that, I started to realize that I didn't have to respond in that way anymore. I was so stuck in the pain, I had to do something to get out of it. And now I've found there's something greater for me. But we've got to be humble, we've got to shift ourselves. Um, they talk about Advaita philosophy, non-dualism. As we start our practice, we have a sense that things are separate. Not just that someone else is separate from us, but that God is separate, that we are here praying to God. And so we start praying to God. One of my gurus tells this story. She, she had this experience. She was praying again and again to God. And then as she'd pray and meditate on God, she started seeing this vision that she was God. She couldn't accept this vision. She kept pushing it away. She said, no, that's crazy. I'm not God. She'd, she'd be chanting to Ganesha, and she'd see, I'm Ganesha. She'd just see herself as Ganesha. She said, no, no, no. So she started praying to Shiva, and eventually she'd start seeing, I'm Shiva. <laughs> <laughs> and her mind was rejecting that experience, because she'd grown up around a lot of people who were praying to God and telling her, pray to God. God is somewhere else there. <clears throat> And when we're feeling separate from that divinity, which is our true nature, then praying can be good because it bows us down, it humbles the ego, it can help break beyond, it, it, it invokes assistance from the devas, spiritual beings, to help us. Their, their role in creation is to help us, yet we don't have the humbleness to bow to them. The role of the spiritual teachers in creation is to help bring the blessings of the divine to the physical realm. Yet a lot of people, they don't have the humbleness to bow to the teacher. Even those Indian people go into the temple, bow before the statue. Don't, many don't have the humbleness to go bow before the many gurus who are living in India. Really, the statue probably doesn't have much power to help awaken them or free them from their, their karmas and difficulties, but the teachers do. Yet the people don't have the humbleness to approach the teachers. Um, the Siddhanta, the Shaiva Siddhanta philosophy is a philosophy of monistic theism. Monistic means that God is one. God is in everything that there is. Beyond everything, God is in everything. It's monism. It, everything, everything, everything is God. But then theism is also the thought that people approach God. They start to approach God from another point. They talk about the, the mountaintop perspective, which this Shaiva Siddhanta philosophy has, which is very beautiful. A person walking on a trail in the mountain, they're going to see the trees around them. They don't see the whole mountain. They see the part of the trail they're on. Their vision is obscured by the other trees. They see the trees. What's the saying they say? You don't see the forest for the trees or something. <laughs> It's like that, like that thought, you know, but if a person gets up to the top of the mountain, they've, number one, they've walked up all the paths, so they've seen everything that's there. And then they're at the top, they can see the whole picture, so they see that as well. It's no less real to be walking down, experiencing some trees around you in the trail, than it is to be on the top of the mountain and seeing everything, ultimately. Just a different place along the, the path, it's a, it's a progression. 